Welcome to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the data platform that accelerates innovation in healthcare. We're on a mission to connect and curate the world's healthcare information to make it accessible and useful. Accelerate innovation, digital transformation, and your success with population health, customer relationship management, and value-based care with Innovacer. Visit us online at innovacer.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for coming back to the Accelerator uh, podcast. This is, so this is the Innovation Accelerator podcast that Innovacer sponsors together with the Primary Care Collaborative. And as you get the theme of the session, we're really focused on this broader transformation that's playing out towards value-based care in our health systems. And if you were with us for our prior conversation, we had a great discussion about some of the big picture factors that are playing from a policy perspective, a business perspective, but ultimately what we're focused on is how our health systems are delivering on behalf of our communities, our societies, and our, and our, our friends and family. And so what we're doing today is we have three guests with us again. So I'm going to welcome back both Ann Greiner and Seth. Joseph, who you met before. And we have a new guest with us, Dr. Drew Albano, who is the Chief Medical Officer uh, for Population Health at Prisma. And I'll say just a quick reminder of who we have, and then we'll jump into some of the discussion today. But um, Ann Greiner, of course, she is the CEO of uh, the Primary Care Collaborative. They're a not-for-profit association that's advancing the dialogue towards this effective and efficient health system with a strong foundation of primary care. And we play, we play an active role in advocating for the professions of primary care, but also the role of primary care in our health system and some of the funding mechanisms that support that role in our health system. Seth Joseph, who you all know, he is Managing Director of Summit Health Advisors. They are a boutique consulting company focused on the healthcare industry and digital health startups. He's also on a Forbes columnist. And I'm sure many of you have read uh, the articles that he's put together on the topics that we're discussing today. And then Drew. So Drew joins us. He's, um, uh, the, as I mentioned, the CMO. He's going to start off by telling us a bit about his organization and some of the work that uh, he does, and we'll get into the conversation there on on some of the topics that I just referenced. So, Drew, welcome, and uh, please please share your story and and what it is that you and Prisma are doing. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Sean. Really appreciate the opportunity to join you, Seth, and Ann uh, for this conversation. And so, just briefly about me, I, I, as you mentioned, I serve as the CMO uh, for our clinically integrated network and. Uh, also have the fortune of serving as a quality officer for primary care, uh, which helps to further primary care initiatives for uh, Prisma Health across the enterprise. So really um, fantastic opportunities and very humble to have, have uh, the opportunity to serve in both those capacities. In terms of the organization, so looking at Prisma Health first, so uh, it was uh, the result of a merger between two large uh, health systems, independent health systems, um, that occurred about four years ago or so uh, between Palmetto Health in the Midlands, uh, Columbia kind of center uh, portion of South Carolina, and uh, Greenville Health System, which was uh, centrally located in, in Greenville, South Carolina, or the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, that merger resulted in a uh, very large entity. So we have a 30,000 employee um, you know, healthcare company. We cover two thirds of the state geographically, and um, you know, we're responsible for, for covering a significant portion of the state in terms of the population. So you think about uh, the state of South Carolina has about 5 million residents. And so we cover two thirds of the state or roughly about half of that uh, volume of, of folks. Um, in terms of uh, services provided, so uh, academic health centers, so basically cover um, all the surgical and medical specialties, um, have a robust group of folks, uh, very talented, um, helping us to deliver care. Um, and uh, just a uh, it's been a great uh, um, a great uh, result from the merger. So um, a lot of a lot of positive for the, the state of South Carolina and and for the state of healthcare. In terms of our clinically integrated network, the Envio Health Network again that was the result of that merger as well, uh, bringing together two independent um, CINs. And so 
Um, with our clinically integrated network, we do have our employed physicians uh, through Prisma Health, but we also have independent um, affiliates. And so when you look at uh, the population there, we have about 5,000 uh, clinicians, and it's about a four to one ratio of specialty to primary care. Um, and again, we, we serve a significant geographic footprint. So again, two thirds of the state um, and uh, always looking for opportunities to try to expand that footprint, expand um, you know, our, our network uh, capacity um, and, and trying to, to match the, the growing population in South Carolina as we, we see the influx of patients that we've and, uh, and uh, citizens as we've seen in, in the recent years. So um, in a nutshell, that, that's uh, the two entities here. Um, well, and yeah, and so just there's an interesting demographic mix that you have in South Carolina. So I, um, as you've shared with me, there's the you have sort of urban based populations. You also hit rural populations. Um, there are some, I guess, South Carolina has in all some uh, disease prevalence topics that I know that have been a focus. So maybe just say a little bit more of those demographic attributes of the market that you serve. Sure. So as most folks are familiar, there are definitely um, more populous regions of the state. So Greenville in the upstate, um, Columbia in the Midlands. We have, you know, the uh, down by the low country. Um, you're looking kind of in the Hilton Head, kind of Charleston area. Um, and then kind of northeastern, you're looking in the Myrtle, kind of Myrtle Beach and Florence area. And so um, we do have, uh, you know, diverse populations in, in all regions of the state. Um, as you start to move out of those geographic uh, areas uh, into, into other counties and other sections of the state, state you'll see that um, there's just not as much access to care. And I know you and I have discussed this in previous conversations, um, but one of the opportunities in South Carolina is really to try to um, improve access to those more rural settings, um, knowing that, you know, the, the distance travel to receive care can sometimes exceed hours. Um, you know, you're, you're talking multiple hours to try to come to one of the other hubs that we mentioned to, to get necessary specialty care, surgical care, um, and even, uh, you know, emergency care can be really difficult um, to acquire uh, when needed. Um, some of the initiatives that we're looking at, you know, certainly want to leverage technology to improve care delivery. And so um, when we think about rural regions or areas where there may be a deficit in, in certain specialty cares, uh, certain specialties, um, having a virtual option can help. And so what I think about uh, behavioral health as being a, a key component. Um, neurology is also a, a, a big one as well, where opportunities uh, exist where we just don't have the volume of, of clinicians uh, to provide that care um, to the regions that we mentioned. And so um, using virtual platforms can help. Uh, certainly phys physician extenders can help. Um, you know, there's there's other methods, you know, where we're trying to deliver care into the communities using community health workers, uh, community paramedics. But I will tell you that technology is really at the forefront of the solution. Um, but the caveat being that we have to have good connectivity. Uh, otherwise, folks are going to be um, offered an op option that they they probably can't, you know, connect with. Um, no puns intended, of course. And then uh, the other side of it, too, is the the tech illiteracy, which I think mirrors our health illiteracy. And so hopefully what we're seeing is as um, technology becomes more integral into our day-to-day -day lives, folks become more adept at using resources like video visits um, or, you know, asynchronous messaging. Um, but we still see that there are deficits um, in that capacity. And so um, I think for us, it's really not only getting the, the resources and tools in place for folks, but making sure that they are able to capably use those tools and resources because um, otherwise we're just not going to be able to, to meet the demand and provide the care that that's needed for, uh, you know, for the outcomes that we want. Yeah. No. And so, so, wow, you, you hit a host of the topics that I know that we're going to going to go into a little bit further before we do. I just wanted to hit two items with you. I, it's always struck me the, the mission that Prisma has set out. So I think it would be helpful just for a little bit more context on what the the organization is trying to drive, because I think that has always been an important part of having an organization that really has a belief system that supports some of the agendas that we're trying to drive in serving communities. And I want to hear about you too. You've um, you bring a very interesting background to your role and and some of the comments that you just made touch on that. So 
let's hit those two things, if that's okay. And then I know I can just tell that Ann and, and Seth would love to hit some of the topics that you alluded to in your opening remarks. Oh, sounds great, Sean. So I think the, the first portion of the question, you were looking more at, at Prisma Health and kind of the mission. So obviously we want to improve the, the health outcomes for the patients in South Carolina that we have the ability to serve. Um, certainly we want to do it in a compassionate way, inclusive way. Um, I think for us, it's really, you know, and again, I'm trying to speak on behalf as best I can for the organization, but I think, you know, we're really trying to be um, at the forefront of where healthcare needs to go um, and not just trying to stay at pace with everyone else. I think, you know, it's, it's nice to, again, uh, work alongside other institutions, um, you know, non, non-traditional health companies. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we really, we would really like to position ourselves to be, you know, the, the front runner um, in how, how care is delivered. And so we continue to look at novel ways as we, as I tried to articulate novel ways that we can deliver care and then also leverage things like our CIN, like um, other, other platforms that we can to, to improve care outcomes. And, and also, as you and I have talked about, you know, make it where it's, it's a desirable place to work, right? So it's not just that we're delivering great care, but we're also making it uh, a place where, you know, healthcare professionals, um, all members of the team feel welcomed and, and empowered to, to contribute their skills and expertise uh, to, to achieving that aim. Um, in terms of my, I think your second part of your question, you were looking at more of my journey, I think, if, if I'm if I'm remembering it correctly. So, um, you know, as I said at the onset, you know, I've uh, just been fortunate with leadership roles since I finished uh, fellowship uh, about a little shy, uh, what was it, just under a decade ago and um, served in different leadership roles, medical director roles, um, you know, mentoring or leadership roles with uh, med- our affiliate medical school, the U- University of South Carolina um, School of Medicine in Greenville. Um, I've also served in uh, department level roles as a vice chairman um, and, and most recently, obviously, serving in the CMO role now and quality officer. And so what I would say is, um, as I've mentored other aspiring leaders in healthcare, is, you know, just be open to opportunities. Uh, I would say that uh, 10 years ago, if somebody said, you know, you're going to be living in South Carolina, I would have said, I'm not sure about that because I'm from New York and uh, just I've driven through South Carolina. I never really stayed there. I, I didn't see it in the, in, on the horizon, but I'm glad, glad I was open to the opportunity. And, um, and then similar to that, in terms of leadership roles, it was more or less just not wanting to be a passive bystander in terms of making needed change. So that's always been my initiative for any type of role that I've served in or, or been asked to serve in is just to say, what can I do to try to make it better? Understand that serving in the role is is finite, right? And that I'm only going to be in it for a fixed period of time. So I, I want to leave it in as good a position as I can. So that way, when the next individual steps in to take take over, I'm leaving them in, a, in hopefully a better position than I started out in. And if they continue that trend, then we're all going to be better off for it. So, so for me, it's, um, you know, just trying to do the best I can in the time I have and uh, hopefully leave it better for, for the next generation of healthcare leaders. Well, thank you for sharing that, Drew. I, the, the leadership is so important in what we're going through. And so to hear the combination of some of the values and mission of your organization and then the perspective that you're bringing to it, I think is is a really powerful one. I, I, I'm going to turn to Anne to see we see some of her reactions to this thinking and, and maybe some questions that you might have for Drew. We, certainly one of the topics of, of interest is that the notion of the front line, the people delivering care and how in their organization they're being supported on those programs, as well as how we're feeling and seeing the impact of some of the, the policies and legislation. So, Anne, I'm, I, I know that you're very interested to weigh in here. So please jump in. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to be here, um, Sean, and uh, wonderful to meet you, Drew, and great to see you again, Seth. Um, you know, I had um, a chance to get a little bit familiar with um, uh, your organization, Drew, and am impressed um, looking at your website, uh, your focus on prevention and wellness, um, and really engaging patients uh, to think about uh, what they can do in terms of their 
uh, diets and exercise and their behaviors uh, to, you know, be, uh, continue to be healthy or restore themselves to health. So I think, you know, this notion of focusing our um, incentives on achieving patient outcomes is really where we need to go. Um, a system driving towards patient outcomes rather than a system that's focused on, you know, volume um, and paying for volume. So I, I applaud uh, the mission and I think it's really important. And I think um, uh, you've got patient stories. Um, so it seems like you're really thinking about how do we engage the folks that we're serving because it is a two-way street, right? Um, you know, you've got uh, fabulous clinicians doing their work, but if it's not in relationship with the patients, because, you know, they uh, have a huge contribution to make, um, we're really not going to restore the health of the American public. And post-COVID, we've got a lot of work to do, as you well know. So, um, I was uh, interested in a couple of things. One, um, I know you've got this dedication to the patient center medical home, and we as an organization were formed to advocate for the patient center medical home. And, um, you know, I think it's been promulgated near and far, and there's different versions of it. Um, uh, what we see is that it's done a lot to move the um, conversation forward towards a more population focused approach. And um, we've got to, I believe, uh, reform the financing uh, to really support that model um, by investing more in primary care in general and these advanced primary care models and also moving primary care to a different payment. So that's just a, a comment. Um, and I'd love to understand a little bit more about the patient center medical home within your organization. And I'm also very curious about your CIM. Um, and maybe our audiences too, you know, it's a little different than an ACO. How does that work? What's the governance? Um, you know, cause you're interfacing with other parts of the health system, including the hospitals. Um, and I'd be curious, um, you know, how you see that role of the CIN and who's, who's driving the bus in terms of the decision-making at the CIN. Yeah, so many great points brought up, Anne, and I uh, really appreciate it. And so just reflecting on what you started out with, I obviously, as we talked from the onset, a shared passion for primary care. And, and really, the at the end of the day, we know that the scales are always going to be um, weighted heavily on the side of the, the, the patients, right? So there are, are definitely way more patients than there are healthcare professionals. And so in order for us to really position patients to be healthy, to, to break some of the cycles of chronic disease, to, you know, put patients on a track where they're going to have, you know, hopefully improve longevity, health outcomes, et cetera. The onus in a good way really needs to be on the patient, but they need to have the, the services and the support in place to be successful, right? Can't just say, go execute on this treatment plan uh, based on a diagnosis or based on a preventative strategy and, and, and you know, hope that the patient can execute you know, if we do it that way, we're, you know, we're not factoring in the social vulnerabilities, social determinants, um, a lot of the challenges that patients have historically faced in, in trying to execute on the treatment plan and ultimately get to the outcomes that we mentioned. And so the way I look at it, and as you mentioned, is like, you know, focusing on initiatives like a PCMH, right, patient-centered medical home, really trying to um, prioritize and emphasize the importance of preventative strategies of, you know, really leveraging their primary care um, you know, uh, again, for lack of a better word, uh, home, um, primary care services, and, and hopefully in doing so, you know, we're seeing a decrease in disease burden, um, a, a, a better allocation of resources for the folks that really do need it for advancement of disease, for uh, genetic anomalies, et cetera, that even with the best preventative strategies, we're just not able to tackle. And so that's where I see, you know, better allocation of resources, um, better orientation of, you know, the patients to the, the treatment plan and pathway that, that's more tailored and suited to them. I think, you know, for us in primary care, it's unfortunately we're kind of in this one size fits most model or one size fits all model. And unfortunately, that's just not going to really make a dent in, in, in improving the outcomes of the patients and populations that we serve. And so the way I think about, you know, using models like you described, the PCMH model, but also using 
technology, as we discussed earlier, virtual visits, asynchronous messaging, um, other platforms. Um, we can hopefully position patients where it's not it's more of this tailored approach to the individual um, that that will lead them to where we want them. You know, the, the end goal should be the same. Right. We all we want everyone to be healthy. We just don't want everyone to take the same path to get there. Um, we want to take the path that's best suited for each person. And so with our PCMH model, um, I just think about years ago when I served in a medical director's role, um, one of the opportunities that existed for me as a sports physician and a primary care physician was that we were sending patients all over for different you know, care needs. So they went to a different clinic for their musculoskeletal care. They came back to their primary care clinic. And so one of the opportunities that existed was to say, well, why don't we centralize you know, these clinics so that way patients already are familiar with their primary care location, right? Their, their primary care home. So let's bring the care to them. And so what we did was we relocated their musculoskeletal care to the central centralized clinic. And that fortunately, um, due to the, the hard work and effort of a lot of great folks blossomed into, now we have an LGBTQA plus uh, clinic. We have women's health clinic, um, you know, expanding behavioral health services, um, you know, primary care procedures. So all that to say, you know, the, the model of PCMH sounds great, but in order to really make it come true, you really have to say, how do we make, how do we design care delivery that's going to be conducive to the patient staying hopefully in one geographic location and not having to, um, you know, travel outside of that home, you know, and I, I mean that figuratively and not just literally, but travel outside of that home to complete you know, their, their needed care. And so what we've seen with that is, you know, patient satisfaction improves. I think clinician satisfaction, because as you know, in primary care, um, our colleagues are very well trained in a variety of, of different, um, you know, subsets of, of medicine. So like I said, procedures, musculoskeletal care, women's care, LGBTQA plus care. So, you know, to be able to, to leverage those skill sets and that expertise um, really does a service for all parties involved and very proud of that. And to this day, it seems like it's thriving. And the other nice feather in the cap was that um, given that the, the setting is an academic setting, um, we have learners rotating through, so residents and fellows and students. And so they get to experience the, the breadth of primary care. They get to share, um, you know, interesting cases or new, op new learning opportunities with each other in real time or near real time, which I think just helps to reinforce um, the excitement um, you know, the, and, and the, um, the, the benefit of, of practicing a more wide scale primary care. Um, I know that that was a lengthy kind of response to the PCMH piece. So I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not being too long winded. I don't know, Sean or Seth, if you have any thoughts on, on Anne's top uh, topics and comments. Well, Seth, chime in, please. Yeah. I, uh, Drew, um, wonderful to meet you, and uh, thank you so much for joining, uh, learning so much already, and, and I'm sure the audience is as well. Y you just said something about um, tailoring uh, tailoring interventions or, or tailoring care plans uh, to the individual, and um, what I'm thinking of is I I'm sure that part of our audience are um, digital health companies, founders, entrepreneurs out there who want to help primary care. And when they do, they, they will think about solving problems at scale. Um, and yet in some of my research around primary care, I, I think what I've uncovered, and, and please tell me if I'm off here, um, but one of the reasons primary care is so, or can be so powerful, is so powerful, is based on the individual relationship between a provider and a patient and the fact that that is a relationship that builds um, uh, trust over time and sort of earns the right of the primary care provider to um, to positively influence um, the the individual. And so what I'm curious about is, as I mean, you are on the front lines, but you also work with the front lines and you're seeking to drive, I imagine at times systemic change in a positive way across South Carolina. And yet, as you described earlier, South Carolina, 
well, it's not homogenous. Uh, it, it, there's diversity of uh, geography, of locations, of patient populations. I'm sure you've got patients with uh, different groups with different needs, with uh, different uh, prevalence of conditions in different areas. And then you've got different contexts. You, you mentioned um, you've got, uh, you, you've got uh, areas where uh, perhaps there are uh, populations where uh, connectivity is, is very high and, and perhaps digital literacy is very high and, and others in which perhaps it's, it's lower. So my question is, as you think about you know, driving change across Prisma or implementing initiatives to serve your patient populations writ large, how do you balance that? with the need to recognize that each patient is an individual and even certain geographies are going to have different types of needs than others that you serve. How do you think about designing these, you know, programs, interventions, processes? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Seth. And so when I'm thinking about it, obviously you you touched on it right at the onset of, of your contribution there was the, the leveraging technology, right? And using technology resources. And so for the listeners that are thinking in that lens or, or working in that space, you know, ideally, you know, we need we need the human connection, right? There's no way that any technology, AI or other, is going to ever supplant that in my mind. I think in order for us to really um, continue to move healthcare forward in a positive way, we need to continue that human connection, right? The human relationship. And to your point, trust is at the core of every sound relationship, right? And if you don't have trust, you don't really have a relationship, right? It's more transactional than anything else. And so what I look at is how do we leverage things like AI, like messaging platforms to basically free up the time so that a human connection can be made, right? Whether it is face-to-face in person or virtually over computer, and I'm not distracting those you know, individuals, both the patient and the healthcare professional with these tasks that could be more AI generated, like documentation, like risk stratification, um, navigating, you know, the variety of options that need to be navigated. And so I think about, in my mind, ideal state would be I could connect with a patient. I can dictate my note. I don't ever have to look at a screen or touch a keyboard. I can say I I would love for Seth to go execute on this treatment plan in terms of what pharmaceutical therapy options, imaging options, referral options. And all of that would be taken care of without me ever having to click, sign, do anything. I think that would be great because then the limited time I have with you, I can actually spend engaged in conversation with you without the distractions and the noise that we've all unfortunately become accustomed to. And so I think um, in my mind, that's that's where technology really could help push us in the right direction and really help improve primary care access, right? Because you're creating more time by having less administrative tasks You're making that time together more efficient and effective. You're helping the patient close the loop once they step, you know, once they leave that that connection, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, And, you know, we can use other platforms for remote patient monitoring to make sure that the interventions and the and and the steps or advice given, um, you know, are are follow through on and and are successful. And so that's where I kind of see technology really complementing you know, what, what traditionally in healthcare was, was one of the most um, wonderful things and experiences was just getting to, to sit down with somebody and get to learn more about them and to be able to help them solve a problem that's plaguing themselves. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love that, the discussion and question. Maybe break it down a bit. Take it to the level of the caregiver, because I one of the themes that we've been addressing in this dialogue is the extent to which technology has been a burden on those individuals versus an enabler. And then, then I'd love to get your reaction on how it's showing up in the way that the, the patient is experiencing. So from your vantage point, how are you helping the doctor and how are you seeing that the doctor's getting benefit out of technology versus the burden or talk that that context. Yeah, so so think about at the core of, of the interaction, there was always a doc, you know, a documentation of what transpired, right? And and recommendations on what should transpire. And so what we're working on now, and I have, there's a great group of folks internally that are helping on this initiative, is really to optimize um, our progress note generation. And so when you think about it, the the progress note and, and really the EMR to a big degree has moved 
more in the in the direction of, of being used as a tool for billing and coding, which we understand in the fee-for-service model that certainly makes sense. But in terms of achieving the aims that we've discussed so far, it's not as helpful as it could be, right? So one of those big initiatives that we've been working on over the last several months is um, creating a, a consolidated note that has all the requisite information, um, but is really serving its initial purpose, which was to track progress over time, right? And to be able to say the patient is responding favorably or unfavorably to the intervention, or there's an acute issue that needs you know, to be remedied, and this is what we're going to do about it. Um, and then from there, tucking in all the other requisite pieces, right? So what is that, you know, what do we need from the HCC side? What do we need from the E&M side? Um, what other pieces of information do we need to satisfy um, everything that we need from, from a billing standpoint? Um, so that's what we're trying to do is to declutter the note, make it concise, uh, informative, and helpful, um, but also make it something that can be completed in near real time or real time so folks aren't, you know, wasting time and, during that interaction. And importantly for our healthcare colleagues is not spending time outside of those visits trying to play catch up, right? So we know a lot of folks are burdened completing notes at nights, weekends, mornings, um, you know, missing lunch breaks, just feeling like their, their time is really um, compromised because they're spending it doing administrative or clerical tasks that, in my opinion, you know, technology and especially AI should be, should be doing for us. And is that, and, and I, I'm sure we want to bridge back to some of the things that you were asking too. So, so is that, we raised the notion of, of AI. That's such a, a topic that's generating so much interest. The trust factor, the readiness is where are you all finding that that is helping? And I guess I'm specifically thinking about the, the generative AI that's, uh, that is, I think, creating some of the interest of, can, is it ready to deploy in clinical context or health context or not? Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of solutions that exist. I'm not sure there is a perfect solution or there ever will be. I think, as, as we have seen in other sectors, um, there's concern that um, used in the wrong way, it can be very detrimental to use AI. Um, but I'm optimistic that we'll be able to position ourselves to, to benefit from AI rather than to to suffer uh, unfavorable consequences. And so um, I guess it's, you know, we'll see, we'll see as the future unfolds, how, how it gets leveraged. Um, you know, I think in terms of one of the topics we mentioned earlier is predictive analytics and how a one size fits all model doesn't really work for anybody. And so what I would love to see with AI is to be able to um, kind of harvest information from the EMR, um, from queries to patients on like the things we talked about earlier, the social vulnerability, social determinants, um, think about their insurance products, um, you know, personal history, family history, medical therapies, et cetera, and be able to give a, a prediction of like which options would work best for that patient. And so instead of the traditional model, which is, you know, for, for the general population, we're going to do this trial and error of, say, a blood pressure uh, pharmaceutical, it can say, you know, with 80 to 90 percent certainty, this is the, the most optimal medication and maybe even get down to the, to, to the dosing based on the patient's, you know, kidney function or hepatic function, et cetera. So I think there's a lot there from, from using AI and from the predictive analytics standpoint. And I think it would also help in terms of, you know, and back to, you know, the question posed by Ann earlier about like our CIN and, you know, just thriving, you know, in, in the value-based world is, you know, we can really allocate resources, capital, et cetera, in the right way. So we're hopefully driving expenses down um, and, and using technology to do that. And so that way we, we, we do achieve our end goal, which is to create, you know, equitable, high quality care that's cost effective and, um, and reproducible over time. And did you want to pick up on some of those things just in terms of the... Uh, well, I think Drew um, hit on a lot of the uh, use cases for AI that um, you know many of us are most comfortable with, um, and uh, we've got a lot of work to do to um, you know really uh, implement those technologies. Um, and it's exciting to imagine that we could reduce administrative burden. We could get great data to help primary care doctors and other clinicians 
optimally ma uh, manage their patients because, you know, they have a dashboard and they, you know, can easily make decisions rather than like combing through the EHR and trying to extract, um, you know, information, which is time consuming and frustrating and everything else. So these are fabulous use cases. I think where everybody gets a little nervous is, you know, will AI, sub, you know, replace, um, you know, our our clinicians, and that's where folks get nervous. And so that's really, I think, you know, where there is um, anxiety about having a bot deliver care, for example, or advice. So, you know, we'll see how all of this um, um, plays out, but to the degree that um, uh, this technology is supporting um, clinicians and augmenting their work and giving them the data they need to manage well and reducing administrative burden, all of that sounds absolutely fabulous. Um, I do also want to point out, though, that there's a lot of technology that, um, you know, uh, uh, gets promoted to employers and, you know, the government um, that is slicing and dicing care and, you know, not about how do we integrate and coordinate um, and pull together, you know, all the disparate data. And so, you know, that's the other sort of technology that I think we should, um, you know, hit the pause button and say, you know, does one more, you know, very specific condition specific app that's generating all this data, you know, ultimately help, um, you know, uh, get, you know, people um, uh, on a on a healthier trajectory. So, you know, I think, uh, lots of flowers are blooming uh, out in the meadow, and um, you know I think it it behooves the uh, leaders to figure out what's the technology that's really going to be in the service of our ultimate mission, which is to improve health outcomes. No, you, you bring up really great points, Anne, and I agree with you that we don't want solutions that are going to fracture care. That's really not helpful uh, for what we're trying to achieve. I think. In my opinion, and I would love your input on this, is could we ever move from a societal standpoint in the direction of like the, the medical record really like following the patient, right? So when you think about a tremendous opportunity, not only in primary care, but just care delivery period, you know, the, the medical record can be in and of itself, you know, um, held closely by different institutions. And so what ends up happening is you don't have a complete picture. You don't know what care the patients received. You don't know the imaging, et cetera. And so we see duplication of services. We see that there are gaps in the, in the treatment plan or um, other you know, pieces of information that, that could have been helpful that we're just not able to access. And so in my opinion, I would love to see how we could not only use technology in the right way, but also be able to position the, the medical record, which truly does belong to the patient, to follow with the patient, similar to you know, like a social security number or, or something that they can take and it would transcend state lines or institution lines. And so, you know, as the patient navigates their healthcare journey, whether it's at one institution or, or several, you know, it can be as seamless as possible. I just, at least from my vantage point, don't feel like that exists in present day. I, I'd actually, I, I'd love to jump in and Drew, I think well, I, I'm not sure. I think maybe ask a question or, or, or push the envelope a little bit f f further, um, because I think Anne raises a really important question or, or, or topic, which is there are where my head goes to is some of these direct to consumer telehealth um, companies uh, we could look at. Um, for instance, a, a hims and hers or a row organizations that have built brands and are seeking to go direct to consumer. They're, I think, targeting um, stigmatized conditions uh, in, in an effort and providing a service that 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 has a need. It is resonating with a portion of the population, and so. Um, and yet that then there are other um, aspects of fragmentation that we could look at urgent care uh, organizations sprouting up or facilities sprouting up all over the place. And so, you know, I look at this in terms of sort of market dynamics and I think, well, gosh, they're they're meeting a need 
But then at the same time, and I, I fully respect that need creates challenges with respect to how patients are treated. And uh, Drew, I think your point that maybe they're the care doesn't follow the patients around or it's not, um, the information isn't as easily accessible. I guess my question is, and, and maybe to everybody, um, how, you know, it, is that, can that fragmentation or that innovation in some respects, can it be a good thing? Does it force us, does it force primary care to, I don't know, to up its game? Um, is it okay or is it acceptable or maybe a good thing if we solve the um, the data tracking the patient and, and data portability? Um, what should be the role of primary care? Uh, should these organizations be partnering with primary care? Um, I, I, it's a kind of broad question, but maybe um, Drew, happy to hand it back to you and and, and get your perspective there. And 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 I. I don't mean to be too provocative and suggest, well, there's a good aspect to this. It, more so, it seems that some of these innovations are meeting an unmet need. And so, yeah, I would love to put that to, to Drew and Anne, get your, your thoughts as well. Yeah, uh, great point, Seth. And I, I think the unifying theme, at least that I can appreciate in what you shared, is really the convenience, right? So when you look at it, what drives people to go to urgent care is what drives people to do virtual behavioral health or use these platforms for their sexual health or hormone replacement, et cetera. It's really, I mean, you're looking at convenience. And so, you know, traditionally, and I, I think Anne can attest, I mean, primary care was really the, 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 the right direction for most folks to go to have those needs addressed, right? And, and you could go back down the list of the things we named, but I think what, what has happened is that it's become so complex for patients and difficult really to navigate healthcare, to, to get established with a primary care office or a clinician, um, to be able to get appointments in a timely manner. And what, what ends up happening is you have companies, as you named Seth, that capitalize on, on that opportunity and say, well, if the patient can't get you know, their ADHD medication at their primary care office, so let's create a, a, a pathway for them where it's convenient. They get a virtual visit, probably get mail delivery medication or they get same day prescription, they go pick it up. Um, and what ends up happening, like you mentioned and, and Ann mentioned is, you know, you start to see a, a greater divide between, you know, this episodic care versus longitudinal primary care, which is really the one of the core tenets of the PCMH model. And so I, I'd be interested, Ann, to hear your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, well, um, uh, you know, we have a primary care access uh, problem in this country. And so, you know, other um, actors have come into the market to try to provide services that are, you know, open on the weekends and in the evenings and to provide that kind of access. Um, in other countries, they've figured out how to um, uh, organize primary care. So it provides those after hours um, services. And, you know, frankly, I think we should think about that using technology um, because ultimately, um, not to say that, you know, your child has potential strep throat, it's 10 o'clock at night, you know, of course, you're going to go <laughs> where you need to go. But ultimately, I think you want to have the data come back to, quote unquote, whatever your definition of a medical home is. You want to um, have the various um, uh, clinicians that you're seeing know what's happening um, and have a record that they can all look at. I mean, it benefits, it really benefits the patient. It's much more patient-centered to have that um, integration happen. And they don't have to be their own um, general contractor, right? The system does it for them. So, you know, I, there's um, certainly lots of things that are, um, you know, introducing quote-unquote disruption into the primary care space. But I'm also curious about some of these large companies that seem to be evolving their primary care strategies like a CVS. You know, now they've now acquired bricks and mortar primary care that, you know, provides very comprehensive set of services in contrast to, you know, Minute Clinic. So how's that whole strategy going to work at a company like that? And I think we're really in this um, period of lots of different kinds of models being tested and um, Again, if we had a system that was driving towards rewarding patient outcomes, 
Um, I think, you know, primary care would be in the catbird seat because we know it can do that. So we've got to kind of move our system there because ultimately that's where we're going to get the most value for our healthcare expenditures. Yeah, I would just weigh in and that I think one of the challenges we've seen recently is the commoditization of primary care. And so um, I feel like that erodes confidence in, um, you know, not only the patients, but also on the healthcare professional side, because, you know, I don't know who my patient's going to see at this minute clinic or if they're going to go uh, to the standalone, whatever it is. And then, you don't, you know, again, it's it's it goes back to the, you know, fracturing of healthcare. Um, we don't have a cohesive model for how how patients, you know, can can step out of their traditional pathway and then back into the pathway. Just it's very disorganized. And I feel like if if I were in any way uh, gifted in the technology space, I, I would try to create some sort of digital compass or something that would help to, you know, keep the patient navigating in the right direction while, you know, doing what they need to do, like you said, in the acute example, maybe they have strep pharyngitis and need to be started on an antibiotic, great. But I don't wanna lose them to follow up and realize that maybe that antibiotic didn't work and now they're in the ER with a more serious complication. So I think at some point it would be nice to have kind of a digital comp compass or some you know, like software or something that can help keep the patients on the right track and keep primary care at the center of, of that pathway for them. Um, I think in terms of some of the disruptors, as you mentioned, you know, we think about Walmart, CVS, Amazon, you know, uh, I think Google, I think is it venturing into that space. Um, I, I, I think everybody sees opportunity, right? It's uh, healthcare is not going to go away. I think everybody's going to, to need it and benefit from it. I think it's just how do we create a model that's not um, so competitive that it that it implodes. Right. And that. You know, we're not we're not necessarily getting the patients where we need them to be, which is to have that longevity and the great health outcomes that we want. And, and, and in lieu of, you know, just being able to treat them today because they were already going to go pick up something at the pharmacy or at the supermarket. And so they decided to pop in uh, to have their otitis looked at or their pharyngitis looked at. And so that's where I, I think we really just need to find a way that, um, you know, we, benefit, we promote and, and really push primary care, but in a way that it's not, we're not all competing for the patient as like a, a revenue source, right? And I think that's where, you know, we're kind of looking at the patient as the consumer, appropriately so, but the consumer in kind of a negative light, rather than saying like, we're not just looking for that, that expenditure today, we're looking to say, well, how do I make it where this patient's you know, we're going to get them healthy today, but we're also going to make sure that they're healthy 10 years from now. And not only are we going to do that, but we're going to break the cycle of diabetes in their family or hypertension in their family or obesity in their family. I feel like that's the missing piece that we're seeing with a lot of these disruptors is that we're going to serve the needs today, but we're not very, very interested in, in you know, generations from now or for decades from now for, for the individual. And so I'm just curious if, if you're seeing something different or if you if you feel like it, you're also seeing the same thing. Yeah, I think it's, I think there's a lot of um, pressure on short term um, results. You know, if you've got um, investors or you've got um, stockholders um, and that drives a lot of pressure to like, what's the quarterly result. And um, I and appreciate that, you know, we need more investment. Um, but it also, um, you know, drives drives a lot of pressure to uh, think in a more short term way. Um, I, I I agree. You know, given all the churn, you know, people are moving around. They're going from this insurer to that insurer, and on and off public programs. It's like, what is the incentive system? What is the ROI to invest for the long term for patients? You see. Uh, more of that investment with state employees um, there with an insurer for a long time or unionized employees with the, uh, you know, the Taft-Hartley plan for a long time. Um, but ideally, um, you know, we'd have a health system that uh, figured out that um, the incentives not only for population health, but over the lifetime. And, um, you know that may mean a very different kind of health system than we than we currently have, but um, agree that's not where we're at right now. Let me, so, Ian, we, we've hit this topic, and I, I I'm thinking of a of the, the circumstance that Drew's faced, the tension of how do you attract and retain the primary care 
physicians in their system. There's so much, so much interest in trying to pick these these folks off. There's also the demands on them that are leaving many to just out of frustration leave practices. So, what's the proposition of keeping them, and how are you bridging that to Prisma in its long term sustainable sustainability of its business? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a great question without a great answer, Sean. It's um, it's really challenging. You know, we we certainly do the best we can to try to recruit and retain you know qu- qualified and talented individuals. But like you said, I mean, we see increasing competition external to Prisma Health, as I'm sure you're probably familiar. You know, they they um, basically uh, eliminated the the uh, certificate of need uh, within South Carolina, so we're seeing a lot of competition coming in from VC and, and private equity for like ambulatory surgery centers, um, urgent cares, you know, standalone ERs, primary care institution, you know, primary care uh, setups, et cetera. And so um, all that to say, as I mentioned, the answer isn't going to be great to the, to the question. Um, but I think for us, it's really looking at how do you value um, the individual and not just looking at them as, like I said, a commoditized member of this entity. And and like Ann was mentioning, it's, you know, they're just trying to capitalize to improve their, their quarterly results or, or their annual results. I think it's really looking at and saying, how are we creating a, um, an opportunity for somebody to leverage their skill set, their expertise, their education, to feel like they're, they're sharing a a common goal uh, with other like-minded healthcare professionals and feel like they're supported to, to do the work that we all would like to do, which is to take care of people, right? To really put them in, in the, the best position possible. And I also look at it that like as a health system, if we do our job well, taking care of our healthcare professionals, right? And our employees, they're, they're ultimately going to be our patients too. So it's like, you know, so you, you, if you take good care of your employees, you're going to ultimately be taking care of, you know, population, the, the general population, right? Which is inclusive of the people you employ. And so in my mind, it's like, you just want to create a model where people feel empowered to do a good job and feel like they, they're part of the solution, that we're going to take great care of them as, as individuals, as patients, but also as employees. And I, I don't know, that's, that's the message I try to get across. And um, I can't say that other companies aren't trying to do the same thing, but um, they might not be. And, and so maybe that, that for us might be an advantage that we can capitalize on. Yeah. So thank, this has been fabulous discussion. I, and I feel like we could keep going into this further. I, what I'd love to do maybe is just get some speed round type reactions and, and Seth, what you took away from this. And then Drew, I'd, I'd love you, you know, we're going to continue this dialogue and we're going to invite others in to contribute. So maybe we can wrap with some of your thoughts on what we can do, where we can look further to help advance the dialogue. So. Seth, I'll turn to you for your kind of, what are some of the takeaways from today's conversation from your perspective? Well, I thought Drew said it really well. So my takeaway here is going to be very pithy. Great questions. The the answers aren't as easy. Um, There's a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to do here. Um, And, you know, I, I, what I what I also will say is I, I think it's really admirable and and I as an individual and a patient at times am very appreciative of um, of providers and provider leaders like you, Drew. So appreciate it and happy to hand off to to Anne. Um. Well, thanks. Um. Uh very complex system we're all trying to maneuver in um, and um, uh, pretty chaotic. I mean, you know, to unleash um, certificate of need and then have these building booms all over the place, (laughs) that's very complicated. Um, And so I think it comes back to, um, you know, we need better public policy to incent what we as a nation need to do um to improve the health of our population and right now our um, i i i i dare say our incentive system does not um uh you know move us down that path and so you know i think we really need some some bold changes to how we incent and you know i love your title that's about population health management um uh 
I think uh, we mostly don't have a system that really incents um, population health management, and that's what we need. Um, and so we don't want it to just be visionary. We want it to be, you know, we want aspiration, but we want to see a clear pathway that we are moving in that direction. And so we need some, we need some big policy changes to make that happen. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, Anne. And, and first, uh, it's a privilege and, and a pleasure to take care of patients like, like yourself, Seth. So as a, as a physician, whether primary care or otherwise, I think we all can agree as healthcare professionals, it is a, a true privilege to care for others and to have that trust to, to care for them. Uh, to your point, Anne, I, I agree. I think that we need something you know, at a, at a national level. And um, I think it, it really does involve uh, having primary care at the table, primary care leadership. Um, and it, it really does involve, like you said, not just visions and thoughts, but, you know, really putting putting things in place. And I I look at it, you know, is is preventative and primary care a right or a privilege? I think that's a question you talk about, Seth, difficult questions to answer. That would be a question I would pose to leaders and say, if it's a privilege, right, then we're going to be pretty much in the same spot where we've been in. Right. And maybe worse if it's if, if it's a right. Right. Then. Uh, and maybe we position our society to be in a better position where we're lowering costs because we're really emphasizing the preventative strategies that we know are going to lead us down a better path. And, and hopefully, you know, we keep our populations healthy. We drive down expense. We create access for folks that really need it uh, for those acute or, or chronic issues that we just can't manage from a preventative standpoint. And hopefully, you know, we're, we're not, you know, fighting, you know, we're not having the infighting that we potentially see where we're all competing for the same pool of resources, uh, but rather we're, we're reallocating our efforts and energy to, to solving bigger problems, which is what I would love to see. And so I, I guess I would pose that question to the, to the group here and certainly to the listeners to, to, to you know, ponder and see if we can come up with a great answer. Yeah. That, well, this has been fabulous dialogue. So thank you. I, I've been taking notes throughout the discussion. And I, I think this notion that we're all on this I think incredibly important journey with very high consequences, and yeah, you know, the empathy that I think we all need to bring to the whether it's the chaotic realities, the challenges of the front lines, or these hard problems that we're trying to solve for, and appreciation for those who are stepping into the fray and trying to make it work. So, uh, from that vantage point, Drew, thank you for your work work that Prisma does and for our, all of your caregivers who are out in the front lines trying to make it work. We're going to continue this dialogue. Uh, we'll invite our, our audience to send in questions that they'd like us to dive into further and perhaps individuals or, or um, communities or stakeholders who we should bring into this. Um, I think we all, in the way that we're voting with our career and personal interests are highly committed to making progress in this in this domain. And it's going to take a lot of creative thinking and a lot of force of will to to bring these things, this, these innovative ideas to fruition. So with that, I'll wrap things up. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today in, and listening in on the session with us. And we're going to keep after this. So thanks to each of you for all that you're doing on this cause. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the data platform that accelerates innovation in healthcare. Don't forget to check the show notes for links to related resources and other information. And stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more programs about the healthcare IT topics you care about. Accelerate innovation, digital transformation, and your success with population health, customer relationship management, and value-based care with Innovacer. For more information, please visit innovacer.com.